Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. There are over 50,000 veterans living today in Wyoming, and Wyoming PBS, in partnership with AARP Wyoming, is pleased to convene a panel discussion on services available to Wyoming veterans and their families. Some of those services are underutilized and some, perhaps, even unknown to Wyoming's veterans. Funding for this program was provided by AARP. AARP recognizes the sacrifice veterans have given for the country and understands veterans have unique challenges with caregiving, career transitions, or financial planning. AARP can support you and your family with answers as you age and face questions. For more information on AARP and what they do to support veterans, visit aarp.org veterans. I'm Craig Blumenshine from Wyoming PBS. Our hope today is to give valuable information and encouragement to Wyoming veterans, that there are many organizations and people who are willing to support not just veterans, but also their families and friends right here in Wyoming. Joining us to discuss veteran services in Wyoming are Larry Bartlebort, Wyoming's Veterans Commission Director, Jackie Vanmark, Public Affairs Director from the Sheridan VA Hospital, and Ken Pearson from the Wyoming American Legion. To my panelists, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us today. We'll also hear comments and questions from Billy Montgomery, a veteran from Gillette, who is also on the Executive Council of AARP Wyoming. And throughout the program, we'll be po posting important slides with key information for Wyoming's veterans. We posted a link to those slides at wyomingpbs.org. As we begin, I would like each of our panelists to introduce themselves and gives our view, give our viewers some background on their role in providing services to Wyoming veterans. And Larry, Larry, again, welcome, and let me start with you. Thank you, Craig, and thank you to Wyoming PBS and AARP Wyoming for uh, supporting this show. Uh, we're a 12-member governor-appointed commission. Uh, our chairman is currently Linda Algeyer of Laramie, and our vice chairman is currently Lee Alley of Wheatland. Uh, we also have a tribal representative, Lyle Wada, from the Eastern Shoshone. Uh, we're a sub-agency of the Wyoming Military Department, and we have a number of statutory duties that we fulfill. Part of those include advising the governor and the legislature on state and federal issues involving veterans. We work closely with our veteran service organizations, and of course, we're strategic partners uh, with the VA. We also have a mission to have oversight of the Oregon Trail State Veterans Cemetery in Evansville, and then we also have oversight of the Wyoming Veterans Memorial Museum at Casper and Natrona County International Airport and the National Guard Museum in Cheyenne. Larry, again, welcome. Jackie, I want to turn to you. You work with the Sheridan VA. I do. I've been there for about 10 years. Uh, of course, the VA has been there since about 1922 and we have provided services for veterans from World War I, World War II, and, and on. So we uh, partner throughout the state, like Larry said, with our service organizations and with the Wyoming Veterans Commission. We also are the primary mental health site for the Rocky Mountain region. We do provide uh, primary care and other specialty services that VA provides, but we cover the entire state, except for that little section down in Cheyenne, where Cheyenne Hospital is, of course. But we're very excited that we, we cover three quarters of the state of Wyoming, and that's a lot of territory. We'll have many, many questions for everyone. Ken, you're with the Wyoming American Legion, welcome. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm uh, Vice Commander of the American Legion for the Department of Wyoming. Uh, I'm an uh, Army veteran, uh, having served on active duty, uh, U.S. Army Reserves and the Wyoming Army National Guard. Uh, my last two assignments were as the State Command Sergeant Major for the Wyoming Guard and as a Division Sergeant Major for United States Army Personnel Command. Uh, retired with 38 years total military service. 
Uh, I've been a member of the American Legion for about 48 continuous years, so that's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, there are a lot of veterans service organizations, what we refer to as VSOs, and they include the Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, DAV, the Disabled American Vets, uh, Marine Corps League, AMVETS, there's a whole host of veterans service organizations. All of them were founded with one principle in mind, and that is to serve veterans. Uh, and that's what they were founded for, and that's what continues to be their driving focus. So uh, my part today is to talk a little bit about the programs and services that veteran service organizations can offer uh, to our veterans and uh, to help them with whatever they need. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ken. I mean, if there's in one message that we want to send veterans today, it's ask for help, and we'll be talking about that um, time and again. And uh, we have a... a, a, a an earlier interview that we had talked about earlier, we visited with Billy Montgomery and we asked him, as a veteran, what he feels most are the most important concerns of veterans. For AARP Wyoming, I'm on the executive council right now. I uh, went in in 1968, and out in 1971. I went to Vietnam, 101st Airborne Division. You know, right now, I think health is, is probably a lot of it. We're all aging, most of us, you know, not all the veterans. But I, I believe uh, health care would probably be one of the big ones. Financial security would probably be another one. Any type of benefits that they receive from VA, you know, disabilities or something, I'm sure they would be concerned about that right now. Jackie, certainly um, health care is top of mind for many, many Wyoming veterans. Um, let's begin right there um, with, with what issues that you hear most often and maybe some misconceptions, perhaps, that Wyoming veterans have about the VA. Uh, well, I think right now, will the VA be there for me in five years, 10 years, 20 years? My answer to that is yes. Do I know what that form will be? No. But I do think the VA will be there to provide care. Um, I think the next question always is, am I eligible for certain things, am I not? And that's a question that you need to really come and ask us so that we can pull your file, help you bring all of that together, do various compensation and pen examinations so that we can make sure that yes, you are eligible for dental or eye or, or whatnot. So it is, it's really on an individual basis on how we provide care. Um, I think the other big question that patients always have, veterans always have is, do I always have to go to the clinic? Do I always have, in my community, do I always have to go to the, the hospital in, in Sheridan? And the answer to that is no. And with the Veterans Choice Program that Congress enacted last spring, that isn't always the case. There are some rules with that, and we can go over those, but we are trying, and we have for many years, had great relationships with the hospitals across Wyoming, because that's how you do rural health care in a place like Sheridan where we don't have specialists. I'm curious if, if, if a family member has really never had an interaction with the VA and has question one, where mm -hmm. do they call? What should they do to make that first um, contact with sure. the VA? I recommend they call the hospital right away and um, just ask for an eligibility clerk. And we have a guy there on station who is excellent with that. He will take all of your information. If you have your DD-214, a lot of that information is gonna be on there that will help him. And he can say, hey, I'm gonna get you an appointment tomorrow to have your first exam, or you know, if that's not convenient 10, 20 days from now, whatever's convenient for you, so that we can start getting you into the system. And in pre-discussions for planning for this, the importance of that DD-214. It's extremely important, and if you or you're caring for a, a spouse or a husband or a dad or a mom that you can't find the DD-214, we can help you find that, the Wyoming Veterans Commission can, any of the service organizations can. You can Google, find my DD-214, <laughs> and it'll bring up the military website to help you find that. And in layman's terms, that form is? Your discharge papers. It's your discharge papers, yeah. Okay, Larry, um, you talk to veterans every day. Um, you agree healthcare is certainly top of mind? It certainly is. Uh, it depends really the age group of which we're talking about. Our veterans in Wyoming range from, we still have some World War II veterans, Korean War, uh, Vietnam War, all the things that have gone on in the Gulf. So each of those veterans are in a different place in their life. 
And so we've assembled a very important part of our duties, which is our veteran services. Uh, the governor and the legislature have been very supportive. We have a program manager and seven state veteran service officers. We also have some folks that are, we have an individual that's a state employee for Sheridan and Johnson County who's funded by a private foundation. And of course the counties of Sweetwater, Sublet and Lincoln have county service officers that help them. We like to say that uh, negotiating the complexity of the veterans uh, world, especially in the VA disability and pension claims world, it's really good to have a, an expert to help you do that. Many veterans who try to go at it their own, abandon the process because it is so complicated. Uh, as Jackie mentioned, that uh, veterans can come see the VA and determine their eligibility. Some of those eligibility makes them uh, immediately eligible for VA health care. Other types of health care that uh, you become eligible for are through the VA disability and uh, pension and compensation process. And so it's important for veterans to really what I call uh, sit down one on one and determine their eligibility see if they've been injured, had an illness or disease while they were in active duty, and file that disability claim to determine the service connection. That's the first and most important step. Did this happen as a result of my military service and what did it do to me? And so then we take a look at that. Uh, that process has improved greatly uh, with the VA. Uh, there are still some, some, some hiccups along the way, but all in all, it's greatly improved over the past few years. And we stand ready to help veterans all across Wyoming. And we'll post those numbers on our screen throughout the broadcast today of where people can call. Jackie, just real quickly, there are two veterans hospitals in Wyoming. There are. <clears throat> and does it matter where, we, where a veteran starts the process from? No, it doesn't. Uh, you could be living in Cheyenne or be going, we have a lot of students at Laramie going, coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan. They have gotten their services there at the Cheyenne VA or at the clinic, and then they move home, and home happens to be part of where Sheridan uh, overseas and so we sure take care of them as well. And yeah. families certainly are, are encouraged to help. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. We get a lot of calls from mom and dad. A lot of calls from mom and dad and girlfriends. And that's okay. Yes, that's more than okay. <laughs> we encourage that. We encourage that. Ken, what role do service organizations play in helping veterans with these this sometimes complex path that they have to follow and have to weave through? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's uh, our job is, is not to provide any of those health care services. Our job, part of our job is to provide the guidance for veterans to direct them to the right place, whether it's a state veteran service officer, whether it's a department service officer, whether it's the eligibility clerk. Uh, we need to be able to let people know where they need to go, uh, what they need to bring with them, how they can kind of pre-qualify, as you mentioned, the DD-14, uh, 214, uh, make sure that they have that. Uh, it shortens the process when they show up with all of this type of stuff that they need. Copies of orders, copies of military uh, medical records, any of that sort of thing certainly helps. So that's our job is just to get people started in the right direction and let those agencies that, uh, that can handle it do though. Ken, we're going to talk about the importance of service organizations a little bit later, but um, I just wanted to, to ask if I'm a, a, a Gulf War vet or any veteran, but I've never been actively um, uh, connected to a service organization, is that okay that I still give you a call? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. We're, we're here to serve veterans, not Legion members, not VFW members. We're here to serve veterans, uh, whatever their status. Uh, and it, you know, whether, whether or not you qualify is, is up to the next level to decide. Our job is just to provide all veterans, all people who have served their country, uh, the opportunity to get the benefits they're entitled to. Craig, we have a very uh, unique partnership, as do most states. Uh, we have a very good partnership with the American Legion and with our VFW and disabled American veterans. Uh, they run the Department and National Service offices at our VA's regional office there in Cheyenne. So as those county and state veteran service officers meet with the veteran and build the claim uh, to submit to the VA, they go to one of those uh, uh, organizations of the veterans choosing. Uh, sometimes they don't select an organization, but they do have the ability to select. And then those uh, folks in Cheyenne prosecute that claim with the VA. And so it's a very important partnership. What is, what is the definition of a veteran? 
Craig, it's a very interesting question and one that we hear uh, there's some very uh, patriotic definitions. But what we like to say when you've worked in the veteran services is that it's important to ask uh, who's asking. Uh, for example, if a veteran uh, said, well, I'm, I'm a veteran, am I eligible for the Wyoming property tax exemption? we'd have to go through the eligibility requirements for that to determine if they're eligible. Very much similar to the health care process. There's certain things to make you eligible. For that property tax exemption, there's basically three categories of eligibility. Uh, the period of service that the veteran served for Korea, uh, excuse me, World War II, Korea and Vietnam, and then uh, overseas expeditionary medals or campaign medals. And then the third category is uh, VA service connected disability. So if the veteran fits into one of those three categories, they are eligible for that property tax exemption. Jackie, let's talk about your definition of what it means to be a veteran. Relative Great, from, the the VA, <laughs> from the VA. Well, mm -hmm. and I guess I, I tend to lean towards that more patriotic uh, definition. I think if you had the uniform on and you served in the military, you're a veteran. But then, as Larry said, the next question is, what, what are you asking? Why are you asking? Because my dad is a veteran. I'm very proud of my dad. He was an Army veteran in Korea, but he's not eligible for VA services. So there is a difference between being a veteran and being a VA veteran. Um, and it's just, it, it's kind of a matter of semantics, but that's, I mean, that's kind of how we have to look at it with our, the way we provide health care and the way we're mandated by Congress to provide health care. We have to see where you fit into those criteria. And again, we'll talk more about some of these issues a little bit later, but there are times when a veteran may um, find himself needing services, but many, many years ago didn't need services. And we want to talk about Stephen Cam Campbell, who served our country in Vietnam, and he spoke about his service at the Vietnam Welcome Home event this summer in Casper. His story is compelling, but he didn't know what post-traumatic stress disorder was, much less that he suffered from it. Here's a piece of his story. I was 40, 45 years hiding the fact that I was nuts. You know, I didn't, I didn't know what, what PTSD was. I didn't, I didn't uh, realize I had it. I didn't, and finally one of, my, one of my nephews was a Gulf War veteran. He come back and he said, Uncle Steve, you got, you got PTSD. I told him, ah, oh, come on. So I went in and I started getting treatment. And, and I would suggest anybody even suspects anything like that, go get counseling and some treatment because it's, it's opened my life up for me. I mean, I, my eyes are open. It's not like I'm, I'm not, well, I was, I was kind of ashamed. I was, I was, I was ashamed and I was, I don't know, I just didn't like myself very well, you know, because, because I, I just, you know, I just, this, the reaction, I could never, I could hold a job, but I could never get promoted in a job because I'd always pick and fights or something like that for years, and I, and I'm not over that now, I'm not doing that now. Larry, is there better advice that if you think you might need help, ask? It, it is, it's a difficult uh, uh, question, and it's, a, it's certainly very remarkable, and we, and we definitely salute Stephen and all the many veterans who have stepped up to, to help themselves. The history of PTSD is very important. You know, in, in World War I, we called it shell shock. In uh, World War II and Korea, we called it battle fatigue. Uh, not till 1980 did the mental health community recognize PTSD. Now remember the we evacuated Saigon in 1975. Mm -hmm. So here you have our Vietnam veterans who'd returned home and things weren't going so well. Uh, jobs, as Stephen mentioned, and, and family relationships, all those things were very troubling. Uh, so seeking that treatment is very important because one of the characteristics of PTSD is that it's difficult for the person that's having those issues to recognize them themselves. So that diagnosis and the treatment, the VA remains uh, the number one uh, provider of services related to P PTSD. Um, you know, our young men and women who are now coming back from overseas, many of them have what we call multiple deployments. 
Uh, some of our Air National Guard members have gone 10, 12 times. Some of our Army Guard members have gone three and four times. Uh, when you're exposed to some of those traumatic issues, uh, there's going to be some readjustment. Uh, the RAND study that came out uh, in 2007 indicated that if you send 100 people to war, 30% uh, of those folks are going to have readjustment issues. About 10% of them are going to have clinical PTSD. And so there's some tremendous ways to get help. Uh, the VA has a lot of great programs, the residential treatment program in uh, Sheridan and now opening this week in, in Cheyenne. So there's some great resources, uh, but once again, it's that issue of someone who's having difficulties uh, making right. that connection. We count a lot on the families to help us do that. I, I think what you need to remember or it w would help your audience <laughs> is, and one of my favorite psychologists up at the VA has said this for years, and it's nothing new. PTSD is a normal reaction to an abnormal circumstance. So that his reaction, Stephen's reaction was perfectly normal because your body doesn't know what to do, how to compensate with all of this stuff and your mind doesn't. And so it's, it's reacting the way it is. And he did the right thing by listening to his nephew and coming in and getting treatment. I think the other thing that people don't realize is one of the reasons PTSD is, has, been, has made such a profound impact across the country, not just because of guys and gals coming home, but because PTSD is a normal response to an abnormal circumstance. And so the mental health community in the private sector has taken what VA has done and used that in the private sector to help everyday people like me, who I'm not a veteran, but if I have PTSD issues, which I could, those same types of treatments will be given to me in the private sector. Can someone, regardless of the, where they live in Wyoming, get access to, to the, this service? Absolutely. Is it available to someone who's in rural Wyoming? Yes. Based on Sheridan? Or Telehealth. Sheridan? Telehealth mm -hmm. is huge. And let's talk about that a little bit. How does that work? Sure. So about three million, uh, so a third, of, of enrolled veterans across the country are considered rural. And how do we get those services to them? So for about 20 years, the mental health community in VA has been over the computer, over video conferencing. We have been providing uh, services with your psychologist, with your case manager. You go to the clinic. You sometimes even have a group session with everybody, but your psychiatrist and psychologist is in another community. Could be in Sheridan, could be in Cheyenne, could be in Afton. And we, we hook them up via tele. And that has been extremely successful because then you're not traveling over two mountain ranges for a 30 minute appointment. You're actually going into your community clinic and you're probably gonna have a group treatment with some guys that you're gonna see down at the Legion and you're gonna create those bonds and you know, I've got your back, you've got my back. So Seth, it's huge. Is that the way it works, Ken? It does, it does. There's a, there's a camaraderie among, among people who've served. Uh, irregardless of the branch of service or where they served or when they served, there, there's that relationship, and and having somebody to lean on is is a tremendous uh, tremendous help for these folks. Jack, I want to talk to you about um, um, where clinics are in Wyoming, um, where the outreach is, um, and um, how uh, whether it's grown, whether it's shrinking, um, whether whether veterans can get the services that they need as from the healthcare and now the mental health um, sure. perspective. Yeah. So we, as, as Larry and you have both said, we've got the hospital in Cheyenne, and then I work for the hospital in Sheridan, and then Sheridan has eight community clinics strategically placed around the state. I can't guarantee that everyone has a 20 minute drive to a clinic. That's just Wyoming. <laughs> when you're covering 70,000 square miles, you can't have one in every community, but we have one in Riverton, Rock Springs, Afton, Evanston, Warland, Casper, and Gillette. Are there transportation services available to yes. veterans who might need those? How, how does that work? Sure, there's the Veterans Transportation Network through the VA, but there's also the, the most valuable one for us is the DAV. And they have forever been the volunteer drivers that go back and forth from various communities, bringing patients either to their appointments in the community or to the various hospitals. We shuttle patients from Powell to Sheridan or from Powell to Cheyenne to Denver all the time. The DAV does that for us and it is invaluable. 
Craig, they're always looking for volunteer drivers Absolutely. as well. You don't have to be a veteran <clears throat> to be a driver for the DAV program. Uh, you'll, you'll put up the information about our veterans hotline. <clears throat> they're, they're welcome to call us and we'll refer them over to DAV. It's a great way for the public to give back to our veterans because that mm -hmm. transportation network is very important. And um, uh, across Wyoming, volunteers are needed. Yep. Yes, sir. For sure. um, one of the issues appears, appears to me is that um, no one's going to hand veterans their benefits unless they ask. And I want to talk about that aspect a, a little more, Larry. In your day-to-day -day conversations, what's the mistake, really, that, that some veterans make in not being able to take advantage of the services that are available? Uh, Craig, what, what happens is in most cases, when, when a young man or woman are, is leaving the military, uh, their mind is really not too focused on making that bridge to the VA. They're thinking about work, they're thinking about education, family, whatever uh, out there besides connecting with their federal benefits or state benefits. And so there's a bit of uh, the, the military along with the VA has tried to transform to help our younger veterans. We see many Vietnam veterans who have never heard of some of the benefits that are offered. And so we, we roll through the, their, their eligibility and try to help them. Now we're trying to do, um, the DOD and the VA would like to say a seamless transition. We'd like to say a mostly seamless transition. It really depends on where you leave the military from and how those programs are facilitated and quite frankly, the interest of the person who's leaving the military. Uh, some folks do a very good job of planning and, and, uh, and, and help that process along quite, quite nicely. Uh, other folks are somewhat uh, on a downside, if you will, toward their service, and maybe they're also suffering from various uh, ailments and they, they can't focus. And so connecting them with those benefits is really very important. And the sooner you do that, the more you can take advantage of them. Uh, we send the Veterans Commission, working with the Wyoming National Guard, we've sent our service officers and representatives of the VA and the service organizations, mm -hmm. we've gone to the um, demobilizing sites around the nation and tried to connect those veterans before they took the uniform off. In right. many cases, they had appointments with the VA before they left the demobilization site. That's pretty uh, pretty important because if we can get that relationship started earlier the more successful it'll and it be. was very valuable when the National Guard and the Vets Commission came to us when we were having our first wave of deployments to Iraq we jumped on board right away absolutely and we were also able to send some of the paperwork ahead of time and we were surprised at how many of the guys and gals filled it out we got it when we got to Fort Hood we were able to say yep we've got your stuff we need this this and this and that's how we were able to move them through the system very quickly talk about Ms. Oh, Ken go ahead uh, some, and most of the veteran service organizations have some kind of a program yeah. the, uh, the Legion has the uh, uh, veterans reconnect program and it's just an attempt to get people integrated back into civilian life from the military there are some steps you need to take, some things you need to think about, and that's just one of the programs. Uh, Heroes, uh, 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 Heroes to Hometown, uh, particularly with, with injured or disabled vets, getting them back into the mainstream. So those are just some of the programs that veteran service organizations, particularly those that are near military installations, uh, do, very, do very well. They're excellent, they really are. Yeah. Larry had mentioned that some veterans maybe perhaps are disgruntled for one reason or another. Perhaps it's a, because of the, it's something that happened in their service or afterwards when they were trying to take advantage of some benefits. Um, what, are, what, uh, what is your response to um, veterans who maybe the first time around or a few years ago um, maybe didn't get the answers they felt that they wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. Jackie, how do, you, how do you deal with a veteran who, who is really making a, a second attempt sure. to try to get services? I apologize. I'm terribly sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you have had a bad experience with the VA. We do not want that. We can't always say yes, uh, but just because we said no today doesn't mean a year from today the rules haven't changed and we can say Yes. And that also means if someone was told no 15 years ago. Absolutely, absolutely. That may have changed. Absolutely. I have dear friends who want to come to the VA for their service, but for one reason or another they don't qualify, but they still come every year and fill out the eligibility paperwork because at some point 
the president and the secretary of the VA are going to open up eligibility for folks like my friends, my dad, or, or whatnot, and they're going to be able to come to the VA. And so they come every year and they still sign up. And the other reason they do is because they understand that if they use the VA services, that's going to help someone else who needs VA services because it's all, it's all connected to how much money Congress gives us. And the more veterans we care for, the more money Congress gives us so that we can care for more patients. Ken, have you worked with people that were told no at one time? Uh, absolutely, and some of it has to do with just getting bad information from the get-go. Yep. They didn't quite explain their circumstances. The individual they were dealing with didn't quite understand the problem. They were told no, and the, and the individual just let it go at that. Said, well, no is no, and, and, and don't come back. So we do encourage people to, to revisit it every opportunity they get. Uh, the rules change, uh, the circumstances may not change, but there may be somebody that understands the process better uh, that can help them. So we encourage people to, to continue to revisit, to continue to look for that, uh, that assistance and those benefits however they can. It's one of the reasons why it's so important whether you want to join any of the service organizations or not. You may not want to. People in my generation aren't really joiners. They need to join one of the service organizations because they do an excellent job of keeping their <coughs> constituency up on all those changes or, hey, did you know about this or whatnot. And they don't have to necessarily do all the hoopla, but it is a way to get plugged in and keep abreast of different things that happen. Let's talk a little more about service organizations. Billy Montgomery is a member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars. And the VFW, he's noticed enrollment's not what it used to be. I am a lifetime member of VFW. It seems like the number of membership is down a little bit and with the newer veterans, you know, and maybe that will change as they grow older and see the need for that political power there that uh, these organizations give us here. And let's talk about um, um, enrollments in VAs. Numbers nationally maybe aren't what they used to be. Um, what are your thoughts about that here in Wyoming? Well, I think, I think he's absolutely correct. Uh, enrollment is down in most of the veteran service organizations. And I think there's about four reasons for that. One is the, the initial memberships that we had were World War II vets, Korean vets. That was the thing to do. When you got out of the service, you came home, uh, you joined a, a service organization. When I got off active duty, I came back home. My mom met me at the front door, said, we're glad to have you home safe. Legion meetings are Tuesday night. <laughs> and it was just the expectation that that's, that that's what you did. Uh, unfortunately, we're losing that segment of our membership. Our older vets, the World War II vets, are, are uh, passing away at an increasingly alarming or high rate. Uh, and uh, so we, we've lost that portion. Jackie made a very good point. The new, the younger generation are not a generation of joiners. Uh, they want to see something for, for their participation. They want to spend more time recreating. They want to spend more time with their families. And so they just don't join organizations just for the sake of joining them. Uh, the other problem that we have is the perception. Uh, cultural changes. The perception was that the service organizations were kind of a smoky bar and old vets went there to sit and drink and uh, tell war stories. And we need to change that perception uh, of what veteran service, uh, service organizations are. And the third thing I think is probably economics. Uh, in order to maintain the programs that the VSOs do, it requires money. And money is derived in a large part from dues. Organizations are having to raise dues, having to raise their memberships, and in a tight economy or someone that's on a fixed income, that's not an easy thing. So that's one of the things that falls, kind of falls by the wayside. The, talk about the perception issue just for a moment, Ken. Is that changing in Wyoming? Is that evolving? It, it absolutely is. Uh, one example, and of course I talk about the Legion because that's what I'm most familiar with, but our American Legion Post 28 in, in Green River started from, from almost from scratch again, reorganized, revitalized, uh, family-oriented, smoke-free environment. Their family area is two or three times the size of the bar. It's a great place for people to go, bring their families, be able to sit down and enjoy themselves uh, without, without the smoke and, and, uh, and those sorts of things. So those things are coming around. Uh, organizations are aware of that. They're changing the perception. They're changing not just the perception, but they're changing the way they do business. And, uh, and, it's, and it's, uh, that, that post down there has gone from like 18 people to almost 200. Uh, just because that offers 
people a place to go. Uh, be among friends, be among people that have uh, uh, a like background, but be able to take the family as well. Ken, we'll ask Larry about the federal side of these in just a, just a second, but if someone's interested in their community about their local veteran service organizations, where can they find the information? Uh, the the uh, service organizations, the, the uh, Veterans Commission puts out a great little pamphlet that's got the veteran service organization numbers, contact numbers listed in it. It's got a lot of the benefits that people are entitled to, and uh, you know if you if you uh, j if you just ask downtown, somebody can tell you who who's running the the local veteran service organization. You can get in contact with those people. Uh, as Jackie said, some people just aren't joiners, uh, and and we that's not an expectation that you be a member of a veteran service organization. Uh, in order to get the benefits, but like any professional organizations, if you will, that's uh, that's the strength of the organization is in numbers. Larry, there is a federal side to VSOs. Very much so, and and without these major veteran service organizations, uh, we would not enjoy the federal benefits that we have, whether that's the GI Bill, the post 9-11 GI Bill, or much of the transformation of the VA. When you watch C-SPAN and you see uh, uh, Congress listening to veterans issues, you see the entire room full of ladies and gentlemen with those veteran service organization hats on. When they speak, our Congress listens. Uh, they do a tremendous amount of work at the national level, federal level, uh, to ensure veterans' benefits are maintained and improved with the changing times. Uh, I would also uh, remind our veterans that uh, the, the, the veteran service organizations have really embraced social media. If you look on the web, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they're all there. It's just a matter of jumping on board with them. Jack, how does the VA use social media? How do you, how are you evolving what you communicate to, to folks that um, sure. <clears throat> maybe aren't used to seeing information in a, in a different way? And Ken's right. Perception is 90% of the ball game. And so VA has to change culturally with the times as well. So VA puts out, we have, every hospital has a website. That is actually going to be changing because it is kind of confusing. Where do, I, where do I go for VBA benefits? Where do I go for health? So we're developing, the VA is developing through my VA, a new web page that'll be one seamless page that'll hook you up to everything. But then you can also be plugged into Twitter. Um, Sheridan does not have an Instagram account because I can't do it all. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have Facebook, we do have uh, Twitter, and there's another one. I'm losing it. But we, we plug in different things. We'll talk about the, the service that we'll have on Wednesday. We'll talk about various nutrition aspects, changes in the clinics, or whatnot. We do use different those. contributors mm -hmm. from throughout the VA. Yep. What is the um, timeline for My VA? We are at the beginning of the My VA project, and the uh, the web page for veterans, I believe, is going to be vets.gov. I think that's what it's going to be. Don't quote me on that, even though it's already out there. Um, but it, I would say within the next year to year and a half, that platform will have been built and tested with a few hospitals around the country, yeah. I want to go around the room if we could maybe, there, there are certain benefits that most veterans know about, but there are maybe some benefits that veterans don't know about. Um, Larry, let's start with you. Maybe some of the lesser known benefits that are available to Wyoming's vets. Craig, the, the best way to describe that once again, and I'll go back to a, a mentor of mine uh, who worked in veteran services for many years. <clears throat> in, in, in a very casual way, veterans benefits can be described to car advertising. Uh, we're surrounded by print, broadcast, uh, social media about car uh, advertisements. And really, we don't pay a whole lot of attention, attention to them unless we're a car nut or we are looking for a car. And veterans benefits can be in that similar manner. Um, most veterans who have served on active duty are eligible for VA home loans, but they don't particularly think about that until it's time to buy a home. And so that connection between where you are in your life uh, for a younger vet, that, that car loan's pretty important, uh, or that car, the, the house loan is pretty important. Uh, for the veteran who's uh, aging, uh, the benefits that the VA officer offers for aging uh, veterans are probably more important. Let's talk so, about those for just a little bit, Larry, if we could. Sure. What are they in Wyoming? 
Uh, veterans, uh, th this is some of the most misunderstood federal benefits that we have. And of course, once again, we, rec we, we recommend that our veterans meet with our service officers. And this is where the families can come in also because maybe the veteran is uh, infirm and not able to meet uh, so the family can represent them. Uh, we do have the skilled nursing facilities at the uh, VA hospital in Sheridan and in Cheyenne, but the eligibility for care is very restrictive. And so one of the things that is our very important mission for the uh, Veterans Commission is uh, the addition of skilled nursing care to our veterans home in Buffalo. Uh, it is a domiciliary care unit now. Uh, working with the State of Wyoming Health Facilities Task Force, we've identified that as an important addition to that care. In addition to the actual nursing home care, uh, there are programs to help the veterans with aid and attendance, uh, non-service connected pension, homebound allowance, and then our widow's pension for those who've survived uh, a wartime service. And again, if anyone has Absolutely. questions, call the Veterans Hotline. It really is a complex system and we really want to meet one-on-one -on -one with our veterans across Wyoming and there's a lot of people that do this and I think you have a slide that shows the name of those persons in our in our key mm -hmm. towns. Those are truly advocates for our veterans. They will help negotiate this complexity uh, with our partners in the Legion and of course with the partners in, in uh, the VA system too. Ken, what's your perspective of some maybe some lesser known veterans benefits? Well, the, the veteran service organizations uh, uh, throughout are, are, at, are organized at the national level, at a department or state level, but most of the stuff goes on at the local level, the local post. The uh, Legion in Wyoming, for example, has 60 posts scattered throughout the state. So there's, there's the grassroots uh, basis for the service organizations. And we deal with a lot of things that people uh, don't recognize or don't think about. Uh, military funeral honors. Uh, any honorably discharged veteran uh, is entitled to military funeral honors to include a burial flag, someone to fold the flag and present it, uh, taps, play taps, uh, a headstone or, or plaque. They're entitled to that. And so we, uh, as an organization, provide military funeral honors, but we're also in a position to help direct people to get the, uh, the uh, headstones and those types of things. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we do. Uh, we can provide, at the local level, short-term emergency funding. Uh, we talked about the VA uh, being able to get to the VA. We've had instances where individuals have an appointment, they're going to go to the VA, they will be in reimbursed for their travel when they're back, but they don't have the money to gas up the car to go. Right. So we can provide those sort of things at the local level. Uh, the larger the post, the more, uh, the more uh, benefits they can provide like that. But even the small ones, they can, they can help get our veterans to where they need to go uh, for uh, VA and medical appointments. Uh, we have a family support uh, a network. When, uh, when soldiers are deployed and the family back home uh, needs somebody to help mow the lawn or help fix something, uh, they can call the local veteran service organizations and those organizations will help provide somebody to, to take care of some of those details for the veterans that are deployed so that they can keep their mind in the game while they're over there and not worry about what's going on at the, uh, at the home front. We talked about the Veterans Reconnect program. We talked about uh, the uh, temporary financial assistance. If a deployed veteran has kids in the, uh, in the uh, house at home and there is a need for, for assistance, they can, the veteran service organizations can provide funding particularly if there's minor children in the house. Uh, at the national level, they provide things like uh, a National Emergency Fund uh, for people who are affected by disaster, tornadoes, floods in Colorado, uh, hurricanes, those fires, those kinds of things. They can provide uh, assistance to help people get back on their feet uh, after those national disasters. So there's a whole lot of those things that, uh, that we can help provide or can provide at the local level. Jackie, at the VA, some of the lesser known benefits that, that you uh, end up explaining quite often to Wyoming's veterans. <clears throat> well, there's benefits for families. Um, there's, Ken and I might be married and he's having trouble and he's bugging me and he's going in for some care, but maybe we need some marriage counseling. And VA, VA does provide marriage counseling. 
Um, there are times when um, maybe you have a child that has an illness because of your deployment um, or the Agent Orange guys. There's some kids that had some serious, have some serious diseases, spina bifida and so forth. VA cares for that. I think the one that speaks to my heart the most though is the caregiver support that VA provides. We have a lot of caregivers around the state um, that don't want to put their spouse in a nursing home and they maybe not need to be in a nursing home. So we come in with home-based primary care, but then there is times when that husband or wife needs some respite and, and we go ahead and, and take that veteran out for a week or two, provide them with some rest, but also then support for that for that caregiver, and that's extremely important. And again, that's not just for someone who lives in Sheridan or Cheyenne. Nope, across the state, across the country, yeah. You mentioned a little bit about families, and I wanna talk about situations where veterans may have been divorced from a spouse, um, how the, the impact on the spouse that was married to the veteran for a long time, um, services that may or may not avail be available to that, that spouse. Um, can you expand upon that? Craig, one of the things our legislature did a few years ago is our disabled veterans were at risk that during divorce proceedings, um, the, 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 the veteran's disability compensation was being divided. And, and that is uh, against federal law. And so we strengthened our state laws by ensuring that the, those disability compensation payments to the veteran are protected. Uh, there's some other laws out there for uh, protection of the spouse in, in divorce proceedings with military uh, pensions, but this in particular was for disability, and we're, we're thankful the legislature took that step to, uh, to protect those. Jackie, do you have any comment about um, situations where a veteran or, or his or her spouse is receiving care and then a divorce happens? Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and usually when that happens, what we see is it was a career military individual, uh, the wife was with that veteran for 30 years maybe, they get out, they get divorced a few years later, the wife is still probably receiving TRICARE and will receive TRICARE and then in some cases depending on how the divorce is done, she may be receiving either his military um, help or could be receiving some uh, other VA benefits. So we do see that, not a lot, but we, we do see that, and it's usually, honestly, it's usually within the military, the 30-year the guys and mm -hmm. the career guys, we see that more often than not. That said, still, a divorced spouse should call the veterans hotline. Yes. And those, that information could be, then begin to be disseminated. Absolutely, we can't provide legal mm -hmm. advice, but mm -hmm. we can certainly uh, help interpret the law and how that applies to the family members or the veteran. Yeah. What about Army Reserves or National Guard service folks? Craig, that's been an area that has tr changed tremendously. As I mentioned, there are, are National Guard folks who have multiple deployments. Uh, prior to the, the tragedy of the attacks on 9-11-2001, uh, many reservists went 40, 30, 40 years without uh, a federal mobilization. Uh, now it's commonplace when the National Guard and Reserve move to the operational reserve of our nation, uh, they're being called on constantly. Uh, as we sit here today, we have members of the Wyoming National Guard overseas and they'll spend their time overseas during the holidays. Um, we've done a lot of coordination with the Guard. As, as I mentioned, we're a sub-agency of the military department. So we are at the planning uh, meetings and we are at the homecoming events and we also provide uh, benefit fairs uh, to connect those veterans earlier in the process. But once again, every veteran benefit is just a little different depending on your eligibility and where right. you served and how you served and what happened to you. And so there is the, uh, uh, we, we have a common issue among veterans. Um, we use the term barracks lawyers. Uh, oh, well, if Ken got this benefit, <laughs> certainly I'm eligible for it. And so it's really not a very good process, but we know that's one, one that's out there. And we say, hey, let's talk to each individual veteran and determine their eligibility and move forward. Thoughts, Jackie? No, Larry's right. Um, and it, there are times when we, we see that someone was in the National Guard and they were not necessarily deployed, but they helped out on a flood. 
they're not necessarily eligible for VA care. So it's, it's each individual person, and depending on what their deployment was, who deployed them. Um, the governor can send out folks, the president can send out folks, and that makes a huge difference. And so we j just call us, just call Bart, just call Ken, and, and we can figure that out. Generally, Ken, how do service organizations interact with folks who served in the reserve or the guard? Uh, we've got a very good working relationship with uh, with the Guard and Reserve units. I think generally around the state, uh, they they're they're our comrades in arms, if you will. Uh, as Larry mentioned, most of them now by now have had yeah. some some form of active duty, a day of active duty uh, during during a period of conflict, and that of course is what. Uh, uh, forms the basis for membership in the veteran service organizations. The veterans of foreign wars, for example, that period of service needs to be not only during a period of conflict, but it needs to, you need to be serving in an area of conflict. The American Legion, a little more liberal than that, needs to be during a period of conflict, but not necessarily in a combat situation. DAV uh, membership, I think, is predicated on uh, uh, disability, uh, uh, service-connected disability. So you can have an individual who can only be a member of one, but you can have individuals who can be a member of virtually every uh, mm -hmm. veteran service organization, depending on their circumstances. So uh, that's uh, that's kind of the, the, the uh, criteria there. Uh, uh, Jackie mentioned state active duty versus uh, uh, federal active duty, whether they're on Title 32 orders or Title 10 orders. Mm -hmm. uh, there there are some some very strict. Uh, uh, requirements and that's up to the people that make those decisions to sort that out for the vet. We've talked briefly about um, maybe some veterans who in years past have, have gotten some information that may or may not have been quite as accurate as it should have been. What if today a veteran is doing his or her best to find information but just feels that they're not having the right luck with whomever they're visiting with, whether it be the VA, whether it be um, uh, other organizations? What's their course of, the best course of action to try to resolve um, conflicts or maybe misinformation or if they're, they're just, they're, they're mad as heck and they need, need somebody to help them figure it out? Craig, it, it, it happens. Uh, this is a very large uh, process across our nation. The VA employs more than 350,000 folks in, in all three portions of the VA, the Health Care Administration, the Benefits Administration, and our Cemetery Administration. And, and there's going to be problems. Uh, the most important thing is that you've got a good advocate to help you navigate those issues. Um, our service officers, the county service officers, our, our state employee up in northern uh, Wyoming are all VA accredited. They re require yearly training, professional development, uh, certification, and so they stay up on the eligibility and changes, which the changes are just now constant is the best way to describe that. And so if you've had a bad experience, come back to us and revisit. We count heavily on our veteran service organizations in the appeals process uh, as we move through. If you're denied a particular uh, service-connected injury or illness, uh, it can be appealed. It can go to the, the national uh, level of the Board of Veterans Appeals. It can go that high in terms of, of determining eligibility and, and service connection. So don't can, give it up. You can assist in that appeals process. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. We count exclusively on our veteran service organizations to help us do that. Jackie, from your perspective, um, it gets serious. The rubber meets <coughs> the road sometimes with health care. <laughs> Again, if um, someone is disgruntled sure. with information that they've received um, from the VA either today or recently or even years ago, what should they do? Well, 90% of the time they will have called me um, and I will have talked to Bart. Bart and I talk a lot on the phone several times a week sometimes or email. And um, I have to say, yes, go to the service organizations. We are, in, I can speak for what we do in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And I am not just you know, waving the big VA flag. Wyoming veterans are really lucky because Sheridan and Cheyenne give excellent care. And we work really well with the service organizations and with the Vets Commission. And we make sure that it's transparent and we're all on the same page. And so I don't want to say it's rare that we make a mistake, 
but it's rare that we make a mistake because all of us are that committed to making sure that if you had a bad experience because you called me and I said no and you called Larry and I said but Larry here's all of the information I would I don't know of one case Larry where he is where Larry's come back to me and said no you missed something so we really try to to do everything we can to get a veteran in Wyoming services from the VA Jack, we just have a few minutes left, but I want to ask you a little more about the CHOICE Act and what does it mean to our viewers or to Wyoming's veterans? Well, it means the opportunity to get care a little bit sooner. That was, that was the goal. That was the intent of the law. Um, veterans were having trouble scheduling appointments. Those right. There were gaps in some states and throughout the country where that uh, was a long period of time. And I think the key there time. is some states. There mm -hmm. was gaps in some states. Um, Again, Wyoming is rural. We don't have all the specialists. So there were some gaps here. Uh, in 2014, we spent, Sheridan, we spent about 13 to $14 million in health care across the state, purchasing care in Riverton, in Lander, in Jackson, in Sheridan. Even though we have the, the medical center in Sheridan, we spent about $2 million at the Sheridan Hospital getting care. Um, the CHOICE Act was designed to say, if I can't get you into a a VA setting within 30 days, we're going to send you out into the community. And ideally, the community is going to get you in sooner. It doesn't always work that way. We're still working out the kinks. Ken, um, as we wind down, your, your last bit of advice to the veterans that, that you work with throughout Wyoming as far as doing their best to get what they are entitled to for their service. They, they need to ask the question. They need to ask what they're entitled to. They need to ask where they can seek that help. And, um, and we'll obviously do our best to, to uh, get them headed in the right direction. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, there, there are comrades across the board. Uh, we want to do everything. That's the reason Legion and, and uh, VFW and DAV were all founded, was to take care of veterans. And uh, so that's, that's, our, that's our charge. There were people who may have been members of the VFW years ago. They can be welcomed back. Same with the American Legion and other service organizations. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Larry, your final thoughts? I, I want to share a little love with our, our Cheyenne VA folks also. They do some remarkable work uh, on that southern tier of our state. They also service northern Colorado. Uh, they have uh, the mobile telehealth clinic that goes to Laramie and, yep. and, and Wheatland and, and, and Torrington. And so they're out there uh, providing that mobile care. Uh, as, you, as you look to the future, uh, communications is going to be very important connecting our veterans in Wyoming with the care that the, the VA is proceeding to put in place. Uh, we're, we know there are some issues with Choice Act and we're working hard uh, to resolve those across the state. Call us up and let us help you. Thank you so much. Wyoming PBS has put a link on our website with a copy of all of the slides that we've used in today's discussion. The URL is wyomingpbs.org slash vetservices. Also, there's a link um, on that page to today's show at, the, at our homepage, too, at wyomingpbs.org. We encourage veterans or their families who have questions about their benefits or other concerns to reach out and ask for help. There are many in Wyoming who are ready to provide assistance. Our thanks to AARP Wyoming for their support in, for today's program and to our panelists, Larry Bartabort, Jackie Vanmark, and Ken Pearson. From all of us at Wyoming PBS, Larry and Ken, thank you so much for your service. And for Jackie, thank you for providing care for Wyoming's veterans. Funding for this program was provided by AARP. AARP Wyoming enhances the quality of your life through information, advocacy, or just by answering questions about tough life decisions. They work in communities across the state through volunteers and community partners to help support issues critical to the 50-plus population, such as financial resilience, caregiving, and consumer protections. To learn more, visit aarp.org.